Tonight, as you're having a seat, get your Bible out and go with me to the wonderful text of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes, starting out in chapter number 11. And uh, if you find the Psalms kind of in the middle of the Proverbs, keep heading back towards Ecclesiastes. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called Conditions for a Fruitful Life. Conditions for a Fruitful Life. I just recently purchased a home in January of this year, and it's got three-quarter acre. It's a beautiful home. And uh, the back part of the property is all kind of graded down into a ravine. On that grading, they put uh, planted some fruit trees. There's actually a grove of fruit trees back there. It's wonderful. I love walking through the trees. Something it just brings me peace about it. This morning, the birds were all out there. Last night, late at night, uh, there was a songbird. I don't know what kind of songbird it was, but it was just whistling this beautiful tune that was going straight into my soul. And I just, I find peace back there. And and don't you know that, that sun and water and heat and cold and all that kind of stuff, uh, just in this grove, I haven't pruned any of the trees. I, I'm, I'm actually trying to study and try to, I'm, first of all, I'm trying to figure out what kind of tree is what back there, you know, because I, I, I knew some of the trees because they had oranges on them, you know what I mean? So I'm like, ooh, an orange tree. Some of the trees, when, when we were uh, touring the house and seeing if we were going to buy it, had apples on them. So I'm like, I know those are apples. I know those are oranges, tangerines, and lemons. But then there's some trees back there that I have no idea what they are. So I'm just kind of watching and waiting, and whatever pops on them, I'm going to be like, hey, that's an apricot, or that's a, you know, who knows, a peach. I, I'm hoping, you know what I mean? One of them's got all these clusters of fruit right now, but they're too small to tell what they actually are. So I'm kind of going, come on, baby, let's go. You know, a daddy needs a nectarine or something. I, I'm, I'm just kind of waiting for it. And so, you know, here, here's this, this beautiful grove. It's got all these trees. And I'm looking at this going, man, I didn't do anything. All there was was just the right conditions, and they will produce fruit. But as I'm reading, I'm finding out that there are things that I can do pruning in the right season. Uh, I talked to a gardener, and he was telling me about fertilizing in the right season. I was talking to another guy that did irrigation systems, and he was talking about not only just watering, but how much and the way that you water. He was telling me something about misting the citruses for 24 hours and then not giving them anything for like a week. You know, you just give them that much, and then you leave it for a week, and then, you know, uh, you, you do that maybe every two weeks. But if they start to kind of wilt a little bit, you do it every week. And there's all these things that we can do in the natural that provide the environment for fruit to grow on these trees. In the same way, I believe that God has given us in his word the conditions, things that we can do in the natural, as well as places to put seed in order that it might produce fruit. How many of you know God wants you to live a fruitful life? God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to be an effective Christian so that when you leave this earth, you will leave your mark on this earth. Not just make a dent, but that there will be a significant impact that you've left on this earth. That, now, that may sound like, wait, wait a second, Pastor, who, me, are you talking about me? Yeah, I'm talking about you. No matter how insignificant you think that you are, just remember your significance in the fact that Jesus paid the ultimate price for your life. He went to the cross and he died for you. That's how significant you already are, and that's how much of an impact you've already made is that your sin, your life, your loss moved the heart of God to send his son to die on the cross just for you. And if you were the only person that it ever messed up and ever sinned, he still would have came and did it because that's how much you're worth to him. You already have that much worth. How much more? If we can believe God, if we can put ourselves in the right conditions and then do some things in order to become fruitful like God wants us to be, will you leave a lasting impact here on the earth and on in to eternity? Amen? So in the word we see that there are these conditions Often in the word, we see the illustration of the farmer, the soil, uh, seed, fruit. It's all very well-known subject by the people that it was being written to at the time. You think about it in Jesus' day, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? All throughout society up until that time that Jesus walked the earth, by and large, most people would have had their own garden. They would have had their own uh, fields. They would have been uh, an agrarian society, if you will. That meant that they knew agriculture because they had to live off the land. They didn't go to Sprouts or Trader Joe's or Albertsons or Ralph's or Cardenas or any of those places like we go to, right? You see, Pastor, you didn't mention the ranch market. I'm sorry. But it's a truth that remains today. 
It's still the same truth that we encounter and that we experience in, in our society today. No matter how much you know or how little you know, God knew that this truth was going to transcend time and, and it was going to transcend the culture that we live in because all of us are going to eat, right? And all of us are going to be able to learn about the seed and what happens because it still works today. So what are the conditions for a fruitful life? Things that we're going to see in the natural, things that we're going to see that Jesus uh, put in the word for us, uh, things that we're going to see that in our lives are going to help us to bear the fruit that God wants us to have. First thing is this. What are the conditions for a fruitful life? Number one is that you got to sow seed. I know it's so deep tonight. I apologize. I know many of you guys were like, whoa, Pastor, you just dropped some major truth on me, and I need some time to process that. So let me give you a moment. If you never try, you'll never produce. If you never get out there and do something, you're only going to get nothing. You know, the Bible says that whatever you sow, you will reap. If you sow nothing, you're going to get a whole lot of nothing back. In fact, the Bible says if you sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. Whatever you sow will come back to you in greater measure. It's a principle that God placed on the earth and in the word. And in the same way, if we're going to live a fruitful life, you got to sow good seed. You got to do something. Let's take a look at it in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11 and starting in verse number four. Look at what it says. He who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. You know what that means? That means that if you're looking around, waiting for the perfect conditions to do something, you're never going to find it. Many times we say something like this, well, you know what, I'll get involved when I have the time. And you never get involved. I'll give when I have some money. And how many of you know when you say that, you never have the money. I'll do it when I'm able to do it. No, that's an excuse to get out of it. Why? Because if you regard the wind or if you look at the clouds, you're not going to sow and you're not going to reap. The verse goes on in the next verse and says this. Verse number five. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. He says, you guys don't understand the principles that are going on behind the scenes. You guys don't understand how the wind gets from one place to another. You know, now in our sophisticated society, we think we know everything because we've taken pictures inside of the womb and we've seen how the development happens and all that kind of a thing. And, and, and we know the pressure systems on the earth and people are studying meteorology and all that kind of a thing. And they've got the live Doppler Channel 7 that's routing around and telling you when it's going to rain and how much it's going to rain and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and yet, here we don't see what God is doing behind the scenes. How does that work? What happens? How, how, how does a seed and an egg come together, and how do they form in the mother's How does that start to grow? How does that start to multiply? How, how does that happen from the dust that God gathered together and breath, breathed the breath of God into? How, how does God spin the earth on nothing? How does God take that nothing and then take the waters and separate the upper from the lower and make the firmament of the heaven and the earth? How does God do that? How does God set the, in place the fountains of the deep? How did God lay the foundations of the earth? How does he measure it out in his hands? Where are the storehouses of snow that he has? See, we don't understand everything that's going on behind the scenes. We just get the privilege of living in this amazing, wonderful, awesome creation that God made for all of us. Now, look at what he says. He says, because you don't know, I'm going to open up and pull back the curtain a little bit for you guys to see what's going on. Look at what he says in verse number six. In the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. Now, remember he said, if you are looking at the wind, if you're waiting for perfect conditions, you will never have them. You're not going to do anything. So what does he do? He says, in the morning, sow your seed. But it's cold in the morning. Uh, maybe, maybe this is your excuse. But it's early. Yeah, that's why it's called the morning, right? I'm not an early riser, but he says, no, no, no. Just go do it. 
Just go. Don't wait for perfect conditions. Don't wait for it to be warm enough, nice enough. Don't wait for the puffy Toy Story clouds, you know, up in the sky. You know what I'm saying by Toy Story clouds? Those little puffy white picturesque clouds that are up there in the, up there in the sky. Don't wait for those perfect conditions. Just go and sow. Just go and do something. Get started on something. Sow a seed. Sow it in the morning, and guess what? Sow it in the evening. But I've worked all day, and I'm tired. Keep sowing. But wait a second. I've got other things that I need to do. Keep sowing in the midst of what you're doing. But wait. I'm out of time. I'm out of energy. I'm out of money. I'm exhausted. Keep sowing. Sow in the morning. Sow in the evening. Look at what he says. For you do not know which will prosper. Now, just a second ago, he said, you don't know how the child is formed in the mother's womb. You don't know where the wind goes and what that works like. He says, and also, you don't know which one of your seed is going to prosper. Did you know it's always the right time to do something good with God? Let me say that again. It's always the right time to do something good with God because you never know if what you sow will prosper. You never know what you sow, how much it's going to grow. You know, by that grove of trees that we have, we've got some planter beds. And those two raised planter beds, they already had water to them. I am like so blessed because, you know what, we didn't have to install that. We didn't have to spend the money on that. We just bought the house and it came with the house. And now there was a big old sagebrush bush, you know, and I don't, or rosemary, one of those things just took off inside of there. And my wife, my beautiful, wonderful wife, got in there with a shovel and some gloves, and she pulled that whole thing out there because, honestly, who eats that much rosemary? You know what I'm saying? And so, like, if I need some, I'll get some out of the other planter that's on the side where it's just used for decoration over here, but over here it was like, we need this much rosemary. So she pulls all that out of there, and we leveled it all off. We made sure that it was all good looking. You know, we put new soil and, you know, tilled up the ground, all that kind of stuff, and got our hands dirty. And then I went out and I bought every kind of seed you could ever imagine. I mean, at Home Depot, I was like a kid in the candy store, just going along. You know, they've got the little stands with all the seeds. I was just like, this one and 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 this one. And, and I think people were probably looking at me like, dude, what is that guy doing, you know? And in these little teeny tiny seed packets, you don't even understand how many seeds there actually are because I was trying to do like one and then one and then one and have perfect little rows. After a while, I got tired of sorting them out and I was just like, Whoosh, you know, just did that thing. And we had carrots. We've got Brussels sprouts. We've got carrots. We've got Brussels sprouts. I, I bought a couple extra packs. You know what I'm saying? We've got watermelon. We've got cucumber. We've got squash. We've got cilantro. We've got tomato. We've got bell pepper. We've got several varieties of bell pepper. I mean, we've got all kinds of stuff. And after a little while, little things started to sprout up. Little things started to come up. And after a while, they started to form into the plants. Hey, there's the peas, and there's, there's the carrot. Look at the stalks coming up. Look at the cilantro. The cilantro has actually grown up out. We've got a cover over it, one of those nets so that the birds don't get to it. It's grown up out of the nets and has these little white flowers. I didn't even know cilantro had little white flowers, but it does. The squash has taken over like, everybody get out of my space. I need some room to stretch out because we're about ready to have a bumper crop. I might be giving some of you guys some of this stuff that we might have so much. You know what I mean? I'll be the food distribution center at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. It's all going to be squash, but hey, it'll be good squash. But what am I saying? See, we didn't know when we started to sow those seeds what was going to take off and what wasn't. You know, I don't know that I see cucumber in there yet. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's a later blooming thing. Maybe underground something's going on, but I don't see too much going on there. Some of the peas that started to sprout up, they came up quickly and then they started to recede and they started to die. And then my brother comes along and says, those things are going to want to run. They're going to want something to climb up. You might want to put some little stuff in there to help them to climb up and then they'll hang down. And I'm like, amen, I need to learn this stuff. You know what I mean? And so we don't know. But here's the deal. He says, you don't know what's going to prosper this or that, or whether both alike will be good. See, what you sow in the morning may be the prosperous one. That may be where you find that you get your best reward. Or, or what you were doing in the evening, that, that late night stuff that you were working out with God, the good works that you were doing, that may be very prosperous. Or how about this? How many of us would like this? What if God sees you sowing and God blesses you and both morning and evening alike are blessed and prosperous? That's the kind of life we want to live, isn't it? So God says, I want you to be ready. I want you to be instant in any season or out of season. I want you to be ready to do good, ready to share, ready to give, ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. 
With that thought in mind, I'm going to bring up my friend Brian Schulte, who oversees our food distribution center. Brian, come on up here, man. I asked Brian if you would come. Brian is wearing shorts and flip-flops, and he's going to get in this pulpit right now, okay? So I know some of the religious you know, spirits might be raising their heads like it should be a button down, it should be a tie or something. But Brian just got back from Jamaica, man. Yeah. He was celebrating 15 years of being married to his beautiful wife, Melissa, who's over there on the front row. And I asked Brian if he would come and share a testimony about sowing seed and being instant in season. Listen to what happened to Brian in Jamaica. First of all, I just want to start off by saying if Jesus was here right now on this platform, he would have sandals on. So we're just going to start off right there. So if you're rolling your eyes, just know that this is Jesus approved. So, uh, and have the beard too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so my wife and I, yes, we just got uh, celebrated 15 years of marriage. And one of the things that we did, we went to Jamaica and we renewed our vows, which was a true blessing. Um, and while we were there on the Tuesday that we were actually renewing our vows, we got up early that morning and got ready and did all the, the stuff that we needed to do and, and ended up doing the vow renewal and did a bunch of pictures. And then after we were done with the pictures, we went back to the room and we're getting dressed. And as we were getting dressed, um, the door, somebody knocked on the door, and when we answered the door, it was actually our cleaning lady. She was a really nice lady. We, we've had the same woman all week long, and so she came. She knocked on the door, and she wanted to see if we were ready to clean our, or ready to have her clean our room, and so we let her know, give us like five more minutes. You know, uh, we're almost done. We're going to go back to the beach. You can come back in five minutes. She goes, well, if you don't mind, can I start in the bathroom, and um, you know, if you're not going to be in there, and, and you guys can finish getting ready, if that's okay. I thought, yeah, that's fine with me. I mean, if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. And I thought it was kind of weird at first, but um, no problem. Go ahead and start in there. So she went and she started in the bathroom. Then she came in and she had asked, uh, we're wrapping up, getting ready to go. And she says, okay, do you need anything refilled? Now we were staying in an all-inclusive resort. And so, you know, we had upgraded our room because of our anniversary. And so we had a um, a full bar inside of our room. And so they supplied, you know, a bunch of wine and beer and all kinds of stuff. So she asked me, do you need me to refill your refrigerator? And I said, you know, you could, if you could give us some water, that would be great. She goes, what about your wine? I said, no, you don't need to refill our wine. Uh, we don't drink. And she looked at me and she goes, you're in Jamaica. You know, <laughs> I mean, drinks are free. What do you mean? No. So, um, so she says, you're in Jamaica. You're not going to drink. And so I started telling her a little bit about my testimony. And I said, you know, where God has brought me in the things that he has taken me from drugs when I was a teenager and all of the things that I, you know, the, the bad things that I did and then where God has brought me today. And so I just told her, I said, God had pur purposed it on my heart to give up alcohol. And I said, one of the things that he shared with me is I need to be ready in season and out. And so there was just something that he was, and so we started talking about that and how, um, you know, I need to be prepared no matter who I'm around, no matter where I'm at, if the Holy Spirit leads me, I need to be able to minister to the people that I come into contact with. And so um, while we were talking, uh, she was, she looked at me and she goes, you know, I've never had a drug or alcohol problem, but you're, you know, I just need to let you know that you're ministering to me right now. And so we continued to talk, and I don't know how it got brought up, but um, somehow suicide got brought up. And so one of the things that she had mentioned, she, she looks at me when, it, when uh, it came up, and she said, I was thinking about committing suicide last night. And so um, she says, I'm still considering it. And so one of the things that, you know, instantly we started ministering to her, I think my wife and I spent an hour with her talking with her, letting her know her value, letting her know what the Word of God says about her, just like Pastor Dan was saying, let her know that Jesus paid a price for her. She was that important. And so uh, letting, get, just continuing to minister to her. Well, before the trip, God had put on my heart to buy Pastor Jim's new book, Pastoring in His Presence. And so I was telling my wife the morning we got up on that Tuesday, I said, man, I bought this book and I wanted to start reading it while we were here, but I haven't even had a chance to crack it open yet. And so while we were talking to her and discussing these things, my wife leans over to me and she says, give her the book. And so I said, okay. So I walk over and I grab the book and I asked her, I said, now I just got this book called Pastoring in His Presence. Pastor Jim, our founding pastor, wrote this book. And I said, one of the cool things about this is it goes through all of his struggles and all of his sacrifices and everything that he had to go through when he was uh, younger, getting started in the church, but how he stayed in the presence of God and the importance of staying in the presence of God and that, how that 
got him through all of his struggles and got him through all of his persecution and got him through all of his trials. And because he stayed in the presence of God, I said, man, he is the most blessed person you will ever meet in every area of his life. And I said, but because he stayed in the presence of God. And so we talked about it. So I'm going to give you this book, but you got to promise me you're going to read it. And so she takes the book and she says, okay, I'm going to read it. And so we talked a little bit more and we prayed. We wrote the, um, the church web address on the book and let her know that she can live stream our services. She did let me know that she, that she went to church and she prayed all the time, but she really felt like God wasn't hearing her prayers and she felt really alone. And so she was dealing, uh, battling with a relationship that was, that was having a lot of issues, that she was being verbally abused and all these different things. And so she was just really struggling. And like I said, she was th- considering taking a life. So she told me the next day she was going to be off work. She wasn't going to be there. That was going to be a Wednesday. Thursday, we had an excursion, so we were going to be gone from 9 o'clock in the morning. We didn't get back until 6 o'clock the next day. So I told her, I want to see you Friday, and I want to hear about what God said to you. And I said, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Promise me I'm going to see you on Friday. So she says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to see you on Friday. So Friday comes around, and I was going to the room to get something out of it as we were hanging out at the pool all day. And when I was walking into the room, she's standing actually right out in front of my room, and she turns around, and I called out her name. And I already forgot it, babe. Anyways, so I call out, or I, I, I said her name at the time, and she turned around, and she looked at me, big old smile on her face, and she was so excited to see me. And so I asked her, I said, how are you doing? She says, I'm doing great. And so when I was talking with her, I said, did you start the book? And she goes, yes, I started the book. And she goes, I couldn't put it down. And she goes, you know, it was, she says, what really spoke to me, the pastor was talking about how the difference between church in the 70s and church today, and how church today is all based on, they, you, you look at blessings based off what you have, and who you have, and all of those things. It's all about what you can obtain here on this earth, but she goes, but the true blessing is the fact that I wake up every morning, and she goes, I can truly look at you and tell you that I am blessed, and so I just thought that was the coolest thing. It was the high, one of the highlights of our trip, and she just, to take that away, and I even told Melissa when we were done, I'm like, who would have thought that God would have told me to buy that book, and because I did what God had told me to buy that book before that trip, he had somebody in store for it that, that was already ready, waiting for it, and he was able to minister, because once again, being ready in season and out, you never know when God's going to use you. Amen? Amen. So what are the conditions for a fruitful life? Number one is you got to sow seed. you got to be ready when God calls you to do something. got to be instant. you got to be sowing good seed every opportunity you get. Second thing is this, is environment. The environment, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, you know. Uh, but there are certain factors surrounding seed that causes it to be fruitful. Think about this. How about the soil? The surrounding of the soil. You remember Jesus talked about the different types of soil that the sower went and sowed on. There was stony ground that, uh, you know, that the, it was shallow soil. And so the, the, the seed would sprout out quickly, but then it would die because it had no root in itself. There was seed on the wayside where the birds would come and pick it off. There was seed amongst thorny grounds, and that environment would choke the word so that it would become unfruitful. In the natural, there are environments, you know, different environments that we, we traveled recently and we went into southern Utah, and different plants grow in those deserts than grow here. In fact, if you just take a half-hour drive, some of you guys may live up there or may have lived up there in the high desert. There are different plants that grow in the high desert than grow in the low desert that grow in where we're living. I don't even know what kind of desert you'd call this, but, you know, i.e. desert, whatever it is, right? Whatever climate we're in, there's like six different climates in San Diego, praise the Lord, that's a beautiful place. And there's all these different types of plants and flowers. The coasts have different plants than you have inland. If you go up into Canada, if you go into the tundra, if you go up into Alaska, there's different plants that are going to grow up there. Why? Because of the environment. Cold environments produce certain things. Wet environments produce certain things. Humid and hot environments produce different things. And dry and hot produce different things. The surroundings are so important. How about another part of the environment? How about this? Time. Nobody likes this one, and I knew I was going to get that response. I wasn't going to get, amen, time, pastor. Not going to happen. Why? Because we hate waiting, don't we? Why can't you just give it to me now, God? I mean, I've been faithful. I sowed the seed. Didn't your word say sow? You don't know what's going to take place. But even in the natural, I sowed all those seeds earlier this summer. I still haven't eaten one fruit. I still haven't eaten one little vegetable out of my garden yet. Why? Because they haven't produced yet. I have to wait and I hate to wait. That's why I go to the store and buy fruit that's grown in South America right now. 
because it's not the season here yet. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. Galatians chapter number 6, turn there with me now in the New Testament, into Galatians chapter number 6, talking about the environment. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter number 6, and I'm going to read in verse number 7 through verse number 10. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Okay? Now he's going to go on and describe what he's really talking about. Verse number 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Okay? Now, I want you to notice, he gives you the environment. Did you notice that? Whoever sows to the environment of the flesh, whatever is selfish, uh, the works of the flesh are evident, they're sinful, uh, sexual immorality, lust, anger, strife, malice, outbursts of wrath, rage, disobedience, right? Going against authority, that is all in the flesh. So he says, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Why? Because God is not mocked. Whatever you sow will grow, and you will reap a harvest from that. But look at this. But he who sows to the Spirit, there's another environment, right? Think of the flesh as a desert. You're going to reap cactus and sharp, pointy, needled plants that you don't really like. Or think about the Spirit as a lush, tropical garden that has beautiful flowers and orchids and sweet-smelling fruits. Whoever sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Look at verse number 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, everybody say due season. See, that's where the time comes in, isn't it? We know in the natural, California has two seasons, hot and not so hot, right? We call that winter. It might rain a little bit here and there. One year it messed us all up. Last year in 2017, we got a bunch of rain and we thought, oh my goodness. And then this year, my wife and I were talking about it. And we were like, we just missed the ski season. We blinked and it was gone. Do not grow weary while doing good. Why? For in due season, if you've been waiting for not so hot in California, it's coming. Eventually it will get a little cooler. But it says we shall reap if we do not lose heart. See, that's where it makes all the difference. Because if your heart is in the things of the flesh and is impatient and doesn't wait, you're going to uproot good seed. But if your heart is in God and in the Spirit, then you're going to be able to be patient because patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It will be produced in and through you, and that fruit will come out of your life. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. Verse number 10, therefore, as we have opportunity in the morning and in the evening, like we just talked about, let us do good to all. So good seed, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, notice what he says. There are two other environments that we can sow into. We can do good to all. That's everybody that we come in contact with. There is an environment that we can sow seed into and we can reap a harvest from. There is an environment that we can sow the gospel into and people will get saved. There is an environment that we can do good to people and be a witness and a testimony of Jesus. There is an environment that we can pray for people, that we can minister to the needs of people, that we can minister to the sick, that miracles, signs, and wonders will be produced and will come out of our lives. There is an environment that we can go do those things. But there's another environment that he says the household of faith. And if you want to have personally good fruit in your life, when you get into the house of God, this is a place to sow good seed. This is an environment. This is good ground for you to plant yourself into so that you can bear fruit that comes out of the nourishment that you receive from the soil around you. That's why it's not good to church hop. Pick a place. Find a pastor that you can submit to. Find somebody who's teaching the uncompromised word of God, somebody that you agree with their doctrine, and you set yourself in the soil of that ground, and you stay there until you produce fruit. You listen. You may not like it all the time. It may not always feel good. I may not like what's going on right now. It may be hot in this environment. It may be compact in this environment. It may be too loose in this environment, but guess what? You're surrounded surroundings will get on the inside of you and eventually it will produce fruit through you. Stay planted in the house of God. The environment, surroundings, soil, time. What's another condition for a fruitful life? How about this one? How about this one? Water. 
Don't forget about water, right? You've got to water the plants. Otherwise, they will shrivel up and they will die. Now, you don't want to overwater. You want to consistently water. You want to make sure that you're giving them the right amount every day. And it's no different in our lives. You know the Bible says the washing of the water by the word. That we are to have a consistent flow of the word. And you know, Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart that there would be a flow that comes out of us. That whoever receives him and receives his spirit, he's cried out concerning the spirit, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And therefore, we can have the word and the spirit flowing in our lives like water. We can water the word, we can water with the spirit, and we can see things grow in our lives. Isaiah chapter 55, if you want to bounce back to the Old Testament with me in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 55, God is speaking to the children of Israel, and he says to them, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, but my ways are higher than the heavens as, the, as they are to the earth. And so are my thoughts above the earth. And then look at what he says in Isaiah 55, verse number 10 and verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 10 says this. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So he gives them a natural picture. We know that the snowpack up in the mountains is what creates the river that flows we know that that waters different areas. We also know that the rains that come through can produce a lot. Water is so important. In fact, we were talking about desert areas. Think about what water can do even in a desert area. I'm going to put a picture up of the super bloom. Okay, real quick. I'm going to break up these two scriptures for you guys in the back. But on the, on the background screen, I have a picture of the super bloom. Next, this is the same image, okay? So you see where the ridge is right there on the right-hand side of both of the pictures? December 2016, look how brown it is. Look how dry it is. But what happened was rains came through in abundance. And underneath the ground, underneath all that brown that you see here on the left-hand side, there was seed. The seed, if it's watered, has power within itself to produce after its own kind. So on the right-hand side, this was the effect of all the rain that came in March of 2017, just last year. Look at all the yellow. Look at all the green that's going on there. What happened was, was that the water made all the difference. I would guarantee you that if you took a look back today at, at that same area, you'd, it would look like December 2016. Why? Because there hasn't been water like that. But guess what? The seed is in the ground. And in our lives, I believe that there is seed that's in the ground. You have heard so much word. I mean, I can't tell you how much word that we have. Not only do you have the word of God, not only do you have a Bible, probably several of these in your home, you've got smartphones with every translation, every paraphrase that you can imagine, not to mention all the podcasts that every time I turn around, somebody's telling me about someone that they listen to, some podcast, somebody's sharing, this message really touched my life. Here's a series that I want you to listen to, Pastor. Here, you know, it used to be they'd hand you a CD or they'd hand you a DVD or they'd hand you like the CD bundle and then after a while they were handing you the MP3 little disc thing that you put inside your computer. Now they're just shooting links on the text messages, right? And people are listening to people all over the world. They're we've got a glut in our society. There is so much seed in the ground, but it's time to water the seed. It's time to get the word working in your life. It's time to declare the word. It's time to let that river flow out of your life into the area around you because the seed is in the ground. It's something listening. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Look at the next part of the verse. Verse number 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, just like the waters come down. And as the waters come down, it provides seed to the sower and bread to eat. See, that seed was set aside for the sower. And they would take a portion of that and set it aside to continue to sow. But the other part of that, they would produce bread and they would live off of that. So in the same way as the waters came down from God and they produced and then they were used, in the same way, so is the word that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty or fruitless, some translations say, but it shall accomplish what I please. This is the word of God and God said that this is a seed. 
That means that it has the principle of the natural seed. That means whatever type of seed is sown, it has the power within itself to produce after its own kind. If you want finances, sow the financial scripture. If you want love, sow the love scriptures. If you want joy, sow the joy scriptures. If you want overcoming, then sow the overcoming scriptures. They are all seeds packed in one beautiful package that if you will let it flow out of your life, if you will water it, if you will walk in it, if you will cultivate it, if you will put it in the right environment, then it's going to grow and produce fruit in your life because it shall not return to God empty or without fruit. And then he concludes and says this, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God wants you to live a prosperous life. And that doesn't just mean money in your pocket. That means a blessed family. That means a blessed life. That means fulfillment in every area. That means making a difference while you're here on the planet. The last condition, the last condition is this, and no one likes this, and you're not supposed to end on a downer, but it's pruning. Ugh. Pastor, you just cut me. Yeah, pruning. No one likes pruning. But without it, we will never bear the fruit that God wants us to. Uh, I, I take walks. That's one of the things that I love to do. It clears my mind as well as it exercises my body. And so uh, from my house, there's a little route I take through the hills of Redlands, and I get about four and a half miles in when I get out, uh, you know, once or twice a week. I, I try and get out and go on a walk. And, and I just love it. I, sometimes I pray. Sometimes I've got my earphones in and I'm jamming out to something, uh, you know, but, but I, I love to walk. And as I walk, there's all these beautiful homes all, all around my house, just some gorgeous places. And, and in the hills of Redlands, people have done some funky stuff with their houses, you know. There's these modern houses. There's Spanish-style homes. There's uh, mid-century stuff, you know. There's some stuff that you're like, they need to rip that down and start over. A couple of those on my route, you know. Uh, different ones that are on the golf course, different ones that are uh, overlooking beautiful vistas and, you know, mountainscapes or cityscapes, different things like that. It's just a beautiful area. Part of my walk, I go by a vineyard, and this vineyard fascinates me. Uh, when I go by, because it goes all the way up the side of the hill, and there's these cool modern houses up on the top, and they got these big, like, rusty uh, metal signs that have the numbers of their house and all that kind of stuff, and there's a couple of them there, and then there's an avocado grove and some other stuff, but every time I, I walk by, I'm just captivated when I look at these vineyards, and one time I was walking by, and I noticed that they had done something. They had really pruned back, and in, in, uh, I didn't tell the video department. There they go. They got the right picture. Look at it. This is the vineyard. This does not look very fruitful, does it? Looks pretty dead, doesn't it? And this was in March, the end of March this year. Look how brown, look how dry. Look at these little sticks tied to the poles. I'm walking by going, man, this does not look like a fruitful place, right? Looks like they might need to take out the bulldozer and just get started over or put a house or something right there. But three months later, I walked by the same vineyard and I took the same picture. Can we look at it three months later? This is the same vineyard, guys. If you notice the ridge up on top, everything, this, it's pretty much the same place. I took the same picture in the same place three months later just walking by. Didn't even realize it until I was studying tonight, and God spoke to me, hey, go back through your pictures. Because this is the type of life that God wants us to live. These grapes are getting ready to produce fruit. These vines are getting ready to bear forth the thing that they were sown into the ground to accomplish. They're getting ready to fulfill their purpose and produce a vintage that somebody is going to profit from. In the same way, I believe that God wants our lives to be fruitful. And I believe that God at times, we may not know what he's doing. We may not know what's happening in our life. In fact, we may look like that first picture may feel like, God, you cut me deep. You cut me to the core. God, I've lost everything around me that I thought was valuable. God, I, 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 there's all sorts of things. Maybe some of you, you, you said yes to Jesus, and you signed up for this thing called Christianity, and you had to lose all of your friends. Your family turned their back on you. You got fired on the job. People started persecuting you, and you feel lost and alone. You're wondering what God is doing. Can I tell you something? God is setting you up for this type of a life right here. God wants you to be fruitful. And if you will hold in there, if you'll stay in there with God, I believe that God is going to produce this type of a thing in your life. John chapter 15, let's close with this, in John chapter number 15. Because even though we may not like 
pruning, we like bearing fruit. And we like putting a smile on God's face. Look at what it says in John chapter number 15. Jesus, and in fact, if you want to read the whole chapter later on when you have some time, we're just going to take a look at two verses. But I would encourage you to read through all the verses about Jesus and the vine. Look at what it says in John 15, 1 and 2. He says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Verse number two, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now think about it with pruning. If there's a branch that's not bearing fruit, you can cut that branch. Why? So that the other branches will bear more fruit. There's also a thought in this that uh, this can be translated, he lifts it up. Maybe you've seen in vineyards or maybe you've seen with apple trees or different uh, fruit trees, things like that, where they get so weighted down by the fruit that they start to hit the ground and that fruit gets corrupted by the ground and it starts to be moldy, it gets muddy, uh, the, the bugs get to it, all that sort of thing. So what do they do? They lift it up, they prop it up, they wash it off so that why? So that it'll produce the right type of fruit. In the same way, I don't believe God is looking to remove you. I don't think God is looking to take you away. If you are staying plugged into Jesus and you're not bearing fruit, guess what? God's going to come and he's going to lift you up. God's going to clean you up. That's that washing of the water by the word. God's going to get you in a position in the environment and in the right place to produce fruit. But look at what he says. He says, in every branch that bears fruit, he does what? Oh, man, I know that was a response I was going to get because we're talking about pruning, and nobody likes pruning. Let's try to get every branch that bears fruit, he does what? He prunes. Why would you cut a branch that's bearing fruit? Does that make any natural sense to any of us? God, I'm doing the right thing, and yet you're going to cut me? What's up with that? Why? That it may bear more fruit. God is not looking to hurt your life. God is looking for you to bear much fruit. God wants you super blessed. God wants you producing super abundance. God wants you to be the most fruitful Christian on the planet. And when God breaks out the pruning shears, put a smile on your face. It may hurt for a moment, but your life is going to be to the praise and to the glory of God for eternity. That's what God wants. And that's what God is doing in all of our lives. What did we learn tonight? Conditions. Some conditions for a fruitful life. Number one is sow seed. Sow the seed. You don't know what's going to produce fruit, what's not going to produce fruit. You don't know if the cleaning lady at the apartment complex, the janitor at the school that you work at, you don't know if the bank teller or the attendant at the gas station is going to be somebody. Sow your seed. Sow the, when you have the opportunity, sow into your family, sow into your friends, sow into your neighborhood, sow into your church, morning and evening, sow your seed. Why? Because if you don't sow anything, you won't grow anything. Get going on sowing good seeds. Second is environment. Put yourself in a place. Put yourself in a position to be surrounded with the goodness and and, and put the seed in a place where it can bear a lot of fruit. Remember the soil. Remember to cultivate it. Remember time. Be patient with it. Water, number three, make sure to break out the word and the spirit. And there's a lot of seed in the ground. There's a lot of good seed that's waiting to produce fruit. So water it. And then finally, pruning. Remember, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because God looks at your life, and if you're bearing fruit, he wants you to bear even more. So he's going to prune back what's unnecessary, those things that may be good, but they're not God. He'll get those things out of your life. Why? So you can bear much fruit. Any fruitful Christians in the place want to give God a praise tonight for the word they received? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.